This is something I share with you each time we meet. Our board started about eight years ago working on a strategic plan. And so we went through a lot of work coming up with a mission and a vision about what we believe. One of the things that I think is unique about our, our mission is that we want to see young people succeed academically. We want to see them succeed in their personal lives. We want them to be responsible citizens. We want them to be good neighbors, moms and dads, employees, all those things. So our efforts are focused on those kind of things. I want to remind us that uh, for the last six years, Coppers Cove ISD has been named one of the best in education by the Clean Daily Herald. The local two papers already know that, so they don't publish it, but uh, the Clean Daily Herald does. And so I want you to know that we are working really, really hard to continue Continue to improve each and everything that we do. This year we started in the summer, began working on the new updated strategic plan, had over a hundred community members and partners who were involved in that process. That process culminated, the board approved that in January, and so Vision 2024 is out there. Vision 2024 is a little more refined than any episode or any uh, iteration we've had before. And so we now are not focused on teaching and learning, but we're focused on instruction and support. How do we help teachers be better? Not just how do we teach kids better, but how do we help teachers be better at that process? We look at human capital, which is the HR component. How do we not just recruit people, but how do we grow people, improve things? How do we get people to stay because right now in public education, there is a tremendous shortage of educators across the state of Texas. It's not just in Coppers Cove. We have neighbors around us in very large districts that started the school year with more than 600 vacancies in the classroom with kids. Folks, it's hard to be real effective with instruction when you don't have a good team there. Now, I realize we've been through a, a, a global pandemic and people have concerns about their health and all that stuff. But when you have that many vacancies, it's hard to be real effective with every kid that you serve. Then we have a new category in there. And Rhonda Burnell's here. She's our director of um, social emotional support. I've got it wrong. I know, Rhonda, please don't hurt me. Uh, but she works on this this item that we have in our strategic plan called developing the whole child, making sure that that child has a good social awareness and emotional awareness. We're seeing young people and adults alike, folks, as a result of COVID and being cooped up, pinned up in the house. And I'm not saying that's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just saying it's created some stutter steps for us. There's some folks who are afraid to get back out into society. They're afraid to go somewhere because they're going to catch something. I tell you what, life is meant to be played in real time. You don't win and you don't lose by hiding and not coming in and playing the game. It's a participatory sport. So we need everybody on the field doing their part. But Rhonda's working really hard with, an, with part of her team on that whole child piece. We have Rick Kirkpatrick here, our deputy superintendent. He's working diligently and we're working really, really hard at trying to make sure that our facilities meet the needs of our instructional program. So what does that look like? Well, you got to have data, you got to have inter uh, internet, high-speed internet, you got to have drops, you got to have projectors, you got to do all these things. And some of our buildings, like the one at Crossroads, was built in 1897, uh, they did not have high-speed internet. <laughs> Jim was in the first grade there, and uh, <laughs> Jim told me about the stone tablets and the chisel. Uh, and it took him a long time to write, I will not talk in class across his stone tablet. Uh, no, I'm teasing Jim. I love him. And then the last piece we have in our strategic plan is stakeholder engagement. We call that community partnerships. Wendy's done a wonderful job in the past reaching out. I mentioned Walmart and HEB and all of our community partners. Listen, we love you. We thank you for the wonderful job that you do as an education partner for us. We want to make that relationship richer and deeper and more meaningful. And so we've changed that to engagement because we also need to do that with our parents and community members. We have a large swath of community members who don't have kids in school anymore. Why should I be worried? My, I don't have any kids there. Well, I'm going to say this. There was somebody worried about your kid whenever you, your kid was in school. There was somebody who was paying taxes when your kid was in school, and they didn't have kids in school. So just because they're, they don't have kids in school doesn't mean they're not a stakeholder, that they're not someone that we should listen to or someone that we should engage, because it's their dollars, about 15 and a half million of them every year, that help fund the operations of Coppers Cove ISD. So we want to make sure that every partner, every stakeholder, everyone has an opportunity 
to hear the good news, share the good news, and be a part of the process of making us the best district in Central Texas. Instruction and support. I want to say this. Let me get back to where I'm supposed to be. This is our, one of our cornerstones, and our teachers engage all students daily with TEKS. TEKS, TEX, whatever you want to call them, that stands for Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. They can't make anything simple in the state of Texas. We've got to give it this long name. Last night, Joan was at the board meeting reading an action item. We pay attorneys by the word, I guess, because it's like four or five lines long, and you just want to say, ditto, ditto. No, but you've got to read it. Everybody wants to create all of these words, and so we have to simplify that and make it real. What I will tell you is CCISD teachers provide more than 750,000 hours of instruction directly to our students each and every year. And out of that, our teachers also, in order to stay abreast of all the professional growth and all of the professional opportunities and knowledge growth, they work and attend more workshops in the summer. Some people say, well, what do teachers do in the summer? You know, they really don't do anything. Uh, you need to marry a teacher. And then you can help her cut out laminating or him cut out laminating and grade papers and make stuff for their classroom and research this and do all that. Marry a teacher and you'll never say that again. Either because you're helping or they've knocked you in the head because you said something <laughs> stupid. Uh, but our teachers in the summer attend and participate in more than a thousand different workshops. I'm not talking about hours. I'm talking about just workshops to be better at what they do. They are continually working to improve their craft, and they want to make sure that they're the best of the best. I want to tell you a little bit about our student population. Everybody says, well, you know, Copper's Cove, I just don't know. Let me tell you, we serve a very diverse student population in Copper's Cove. If you look at our, our ethnic breakdown of kids, this comes straight out of our data system. There's no headliner that takes more room than others. Everybody in there is important and counts for us. Let me share with you how, how diverse we really are. In Coppers Cove ISD, how many people speak more than one language in this room? And Tom, East Texan does not count as a second language. Uh, Hillbilly does, but not East Texan. Anybody speak more than one language? Anybody speak more than two? Anybody speak more than three? In Coppers Cove ISD, we have students who speak 23 different languages. I can't even say some of them, so I know I can't speak it. Now, I may be sneezing one day and come up with a word, but uh, probably, I don't know, we have kids who speak Swahili, we have them speak Korean, Italian, German, Yoruba, I don't know where that's from, uh, Guyanese, Akan, Arabic, Nepali, Mandarin, Croatian, just to name a few. And we may have some Ukrainians before it's over with. We may have Russia before it's over with. But folks, we have a very diverse student population that makes up who we serve. And you know what? Every one of those kids deserve a world-class education, and we're going to work really hard to provide it. When we look at academic performance, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta make sure my slide comes up there. We always celebrate good things about academic performance. I want you to know 95% of what we do is teach kids to read, write, do math, science, all those things. So some of you in this room think we only do athletics, Tony. Uh, but we actually do a lot of other work. 95% of what we do is classroom work. And we're trying to help kids develop skills that they need to be successful in life. So I want to share with you just a little data. You know, we had a, a, a global pandemic, and across this state, kids did not fare very well. Kids don't do well when they're at home with no adult supervision, and they're on virtual learning. Why? Eddie Wilson and I talked about this one day, and Eddie told me, when he was little, if his mama told him to do something and cartoons were on, he always would go for the cartoons. No, he didn't. Eddie didn't say it. <laughs> but if you put an eight-year-old in a house and you say, hey, I've got to go to work. Don't turn on the stove. Don't do this. Don't do that. I want you to get on at 9 o'clock and do your virtual learning session. And Scooby-Doo is on. Now, I don't know if that's even cartoon anymore. Scooby-Doo was on Roadrunner. Those people were on when I was little. Do you think that child's going to make an educated guess at going to Scooby-Doo or going to virtual learning. I can tell you many of them chose Scooby-Doo. Uh, and so we were worried about our kids. And yes, we've seen some regression. TEA will tell you that because of the pandemic, that the average across the state of Texas, kids are set back anywhere from two to four years in academic achievement. You know why? It's just like it is when you get old and don't do much. If you don't use it, you lose it. 
So when you're not growing that little brain, do you know that 80% of everything you know, you learn before you're three years old? Some of you quit learning then. But uh, 80% by the time you're out of your third, your third year. In the rest of your life, folks, college, PhD programs, military, all those things is just 20% of all you'll ever know. And you look at me and you say, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, you have to learn to walk and talk and balance and do all those other things that you don't learn, have to relearn unless you have some traumatic injury or stroke or something like that. But folks, when you miss those windows to be able to pour into kids the ability to learn, that can be catastrophic. And I don't know about you, but when I retire and end up in the old folks' home, when that individual comes down the hallway with a fleet enema, I want them to know which end it goes in. I want them to be able to read the directions and say, insert here. I don't want it in the wrong place. I don't want to practice it. I want to make sure it's right. So here's what I'm going to tell you. If you look up here and look at all the good news, our kids, on average, yes, we have five and six-year graduates. Again, that's Jim. Took him six years just to get out of third grade. Jim, thank you for being here today. You're helping me out a lot. No, it's because Jim is older than the teacher. Um, but we have kids who, because of uh, their uh, learning ability or disability, it takes them a little longer to get something done. We have kids that are dropout or they're homeless. Folks, we have a young man right now that's sleeping in front. Where's our librarian for the city? Homeless kids sleeping in front of the library every night. He's one of our kids. When life gets tough, what do those kids do? They survive. And sometimes they walk away from public education, even though it is the most powerful tool we have to change their life. And so we have those kids that take a little longer. You know what? It's not how long it takes you. It's do you reach the destination? Do you get there? I'm not a traditional student. When I left high school and I went to work and then I went to school, I had to quit because of financial issues. I had nobody to help me. Only after I married did I go back. My wife says to me the other day, our oldest son got married. You know, Joe, he's 27 and I'm just worried he's too young. I said, Cheryl, we were married when I was 22 years old. And I didn't have a college degree. I didn't do any of that. I was working doing this. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> We've been married a while. Um, but look at the statistics up here for what our kids did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip back here real quick because I want to brag a little bit about something that was shared with us. Hey, we're above the state average for five and six year graduation rates. We're above the average for special education graduation rates. Do you know how challenging it could be for a child with an intellectual disability to graduate high school? And we beat the state average on graduating those kids. We're above the state average and region average for students who are meeting the TSI. That's the entry level exam in math and, and reading to be able to get into college. We want them there. We're above the state average for graduates completing a CTE coherent sequence of courses. What does that mean? It means they've been in courses more than twice and they're working towards some industry certification. Listen, you don't need a college degree to make a really good living right now. There's research out of our local Workforce Commission, Workforce Development Board that will tell you some of the most promising and highest paid careers do not have a four-year degree. Now, CTC offers some vocational programming, and they offer some two-year degrees, and they get kids on the right track. Military provides some tremendous training for folks, and they can go out and make an honorable living. They can pay their bills and live a good life. I'm not saying four-year degree is not important. I'm just saying there has to be multiple pathways because every kid is not designed for that four-year degree. Every kid is not cut out for that. CCISD also exceeds the state average in special education students graduating under an advanced degree plan. So when people say to me, well, you know, those special ed kids can't do much, phooey to you. We prove it every day, and our folks who work with those kids prove it each and every day that they do that. Coppers Cove is also above the state average in number of graduates fulfilling that TSI and reading requirement, above the average in SAT results for math and reading, and above, pardon me, in math, and above the Texas average in SAT for ELAR, which is reading, English language arts. Our kids are doing very, very well. 
Career and Technology, we offer five endorsement areas and more than 30 programs of study in everything from arts and humanities, business and industry, multidisciplinary, public service, and STEM. Last year, our kids earned more than $2 million in scholarships when they graduated Coppers Cove High School. They were fulfilling leadership roles in aerospace and chemical engineers, welders, automotive technicians, chefs, pharmacists, and a few future educators. The 2021 senior class committed to four-year and two-year colleges and vocational schools and military service, and those young people are going to be leaders in the industry, and you will find them in Massachusetts, New Mexico, Illinois, Ohio, Oklahoma. I don't know why they went to Oklahoma, but... Uh, <laughs> And they'll end up at things like Texas A&M, yes, the great junior college in Bryan uh, College Station. And they'll go to the other junior college in Austin that Rick's from, UT, I believe. Uh, but they'll end up at Texas A&M Central Texas, yes, our local university. They'll end up at CTC, even though they call it affectionately Harvard on the Hill. They'll go. Why? Because parents need that very affordable opportunity for their kids. We are blessed to be surrounded by educational opportunities for young people. And I'm going to tell you what, when you don't take advantage of it, shame, 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 because there's always a way. I met with CTC the other day. They have money out there that came through the CARES Act. They have scholarships. They have all that. If a kid is not in college, it's because they don't want to be there or they don't know about the opportunity. There's not an excuse for failure. So we want to thank our partners, and I'm going to see if I can catch up. I think I'm caught up. Oh, there we go. We had 688 students enrolled in 103 different dual credit courses, predominantly there at CTC. We offer dual credit courses at the Copper Scove High School. And for kids who want to dive in a little deeper, we have an early college program at CTC, and we bus kids out there every day. And they get to take courses alongside other adults. They'll be in there with some military personnel who's taken it. They'll be in there with some folks that are my age and maybe some that are older. But they will be taking courses and they'll be participating in the real world just like everyone else. And CTC has been such a good partner. They don't make them just focus on academic. They can be in the, uh, in the uh, work prep program. We used to call that you know, work study and all that other stuff or vocational. It really is preparation for work beyond high school and college. We have 342, 362 courses being taken through UT on-ramps. We have a program where we partner with UT, and those kids can earn high school and college credit, and it doesn't cost them if they're a free reduced lunch kid. The cost is minimal. And they take things like chemistry and physics and all those other things. So we're very, very excited about that. 850 credit hours being taken through CTC, and our students earn more than 1,936 hours of college credit as high school students. There's a lady who shared a quote one time when we were at a conference named Dr. Sally Downey, and she says, listen, every passion needs a paycheck, and every scholar needs a skill. I don't care whether it's saving puppies or making hats for babies in the NICU or whether it's just taking care of making lap blankets for older folks who are in nursing facilities or it's just trying to beautify your city. You can have a passion, and that's a wonderful thing to pursue. But, folks, ultimately you got to pay your bill because we won't always have government paychecks coming to us for things that we didn't earn. There's going to come a day whenever we have to reckon with that and pay those dollars back. Kids have to have a skill. They have to have a paycheck to make that happen. So we work diligently to make sure that there is honor in all work and that it's meaningful tasks that keep us focused in life. Let me tell you a little bit about instructional support. I'm going to get off of them because that's the big part. Amanda provided me lots of data. So, Amanda, am I doing okay, you know, bragging on instructional support? Um, in addition to our dual credit courses, CACISD and CTC partner, and we offer 92 additional college courses to our students through the early college and on-campus dual credit. Next year, we'll increase that number, and we'll even offer more students. Next year, we're looking at a uh, child care, uh, early childhood certification for those kids, and we're working right now getting, trying to get transcripts evaluated for our staff to be able to provide that. I want to share this with you, and these are great celebrations. And I tell these to my fellow superintendents over in East Coppers Cove. Uh, you don't know where East Coppers Cove is? That's Colleen, Belton, Salado, Temple. That's East Coppers Cove. <clears throat> They're just zoned differently. Uh, CCISD outperformed the region. That's Region 12. 
uh, almost 100 school districts in the state in almost e all areas of state mandated assessment. In grades three through five, the district passing stu standard average exceeded the state in approaching the standard average in every assessment taken, third grade reading and math, fourth grade reading, math and writing, and fifth grade reading, math and science. All of those were at or above the state average and outperformed all of our peers. So if you want to talk about a quality education, you got to go west to get the best, and you got to come to Copper's Cove to get it. Uh, some elementary campuses we saw, yes. Some elementary campuses we saw gain in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, 14% gain in academic performance. Folks, that's phenomenal. You had campuses that lost, uh, and districts that lost 35 percentage points of academics. And we have campuses gaining 14 and 15%. It's a tribute to the teachers who are in the classroom, the leadership that's on campus, and then those folks at the district office who help. We also perform very well in the fourth grade reading, fourth grade math, and fifth grade math, outperforming the state respectively by seven percentage points, 12 percentage points, and 11 percentage points. We didn't just skim by it, we blew them away. Whenever scores were released, I got a call from the regional service center. They said, hey, Joe, what, what are y'all doing? I said, well, we're teaching. We're teaching. And they said, can we come and figure out what y'all are doing? So Amanda and her folks have helped some other districts around us figure out what we're doing with reading. And one of the things that we're working really hard on, and I'm running over some other slides, but we're going to have to skip them anyway because time's getting away. But we focus very intently on teaching reading to young kids. All you retired teachers, you'll love this. If a kid can't read, they can't do anything else. So we teach them to read first. And we use not whole language where they don't know anything other than sight words. We teach phonics and phonetics and phonemic awareness and all those things to make sure that kid gets a well-rounded and balanced education for reading. In grades six through eight, um, including sixth grade reading and math, seventh grade reading, eighth grade reading, math, social studies, and science, which is every test they take. CCISD performed exceptionally well, outperforming the state by 12 percentage points, and in eighth grade social studies, outperforming the state by eight percentage points. We didn't just take a walk, we blew them away. In grades nine through 12 at the high school and crossroads, our students performed exceptionally well in biology, English two, and US history. For biology and English two, CCISD tied with the state average, and for history, CCISD outperformed the state in the region by uh, two percentage points. CCISD's bilingual program, those kids who come to us who do not speak English fluently, we have a program for them. You know what? Those kids outperformed their non-bilingual peers on the state assessment. So our bilingual teachers do an exceptional job. 52% of our students already at Coppers Cove High School have earned their CCMR, College Career and Military Readiness. They have to pass their STAR test, they have to pass a TSI, they have to have taken a coherent sequence of courses, they have to do a lot of things to be able to meet that. Right now, we're ahead of where we were last year, and last year we finished with more than 64% of our seniors meeting the college and career readiness standard. So we're very excited about the work that our, that our teachers do, and people say all the time, well, you know, how are y'all doing? Very well, thank you. And so we're very proud of that. We have done a number of things, and so you see the Reading Academies piece there that's all about teaching these, these teachers how to teach reading. Well, why would you need to do that? Because right now we have more teachers in the profession who are alt certified than went through a traditional prep program. And in alt certified, they don't have to have a reading specialty. I could look at that table back there of past educators, retired educators, and if they were elementary, I could say, how many of y'all have a reading endorsement? Most of them would raise their hand and say, I had to because in elementary we taught reading, and that's what we did. That's not what, the, what how it works anymore. The other thing is our instructional services department partnered, and we secured five T-class grants. That's about $2.5 million that will be given to the district over the next two years, this year and two more years. Years, and we said all of that money is going to be focused on helping kids overcome learning loss. Nothing went into building something crazy or buying something that nobody will use. It's all focused on learning loss for kids. One of the programs that we're very, very proud of, Rhonda Burnell is our director of, of uh, social and emotional wellness for kids. I want you to know she is, she's phenomenal. Uh, there's no other school districts in here, so you won't be hiring her from us. Uh, 
don't tell that to Colleen. They recruit. But uh, she implemented a program with Dale Children's Hospital, and we call it T-Chat. And that, whenever we were in the middle of this pandemic, we had kids who couldn't get support services for mental health. Well, what do you do with those families that couldn't get that kind of support for the kids? Folks, we have to provide it some way. So we partnered with Dale Children's Hospital, and they do a virtual thing, and every kid is eligible to go. And so we've expanded that, and it has been a phenomenal opportunity for our families. Uh, the last thing that I want to say about instruction and support, so no, it's, it's not the last, but it will be the last. We're going to skip a few slides. One of the things we're most proud of is we had eight campuses awarded the Purple Star Campus designation. That is the designation they had to apply for. It's very strict criteria. That identifies those campuses as military-friendly campuses, not just to kids, but to families. We're very excited for the work that was done there. Very, very excited for the opportunities that exist there. And we partner with Fort Hood. Uh, Terry Jones is here somewhere. Where are you, Terry? We partner with Fort Hood. Terry used to belong to us, Fort Hood Stoller. Um, but Terry helps with that. And I'm going to tell you, it's a wonderful program of support for our families and creates some tremendously strong connections between uh, military families and the school district. So we're very proud of that. We offer a variety of summer camps. You see them up here and we're going to offer more this year. We want kids to be involved in exciting things that motivate and encourage them. So, you know, if you're not doing really well and they say, hey, you, you, you got to go to summer school again this year. That's not very exciting. But if I can go to coding camp or I can go to this math camp or I can go to robotics, you know what? In robotics, we teach you a lot of math. We teach you a lot of ways to apply mathematics. So camps are a great thing for us. The other thing I'm going to share with you is our second pillar, which is human capital. Human capital is all about our personnel. We want to have the very best personnel in this district. I want you to know we, are the, we have the highest math stipend in the state of Texas. If you're a certified secondary math teacher and you're teaching math, you earn a $10,000 stipend for being a math teacher in Copper's Cove. When we adopted that, the lady at TASB who does our pay study said, Dr. aren't you sure you want to go that high? I said, yes, because we have vacancies and we need math teachers. And so we have hired some very, very good math teachers out of that and we want to cultivate more. We have about 1,436 total staff. You see the breakdown on them. Majority of our folks are, are teachers, but there's a lot of folks that help teachers teach. For example, at May Stevens Early Learning Academy, you cannot have more than one adult for every, I mean, you can't have less than one adult for every 11 kids. So in every classroom, there's an adult, there's a teacher and an aide. So we see those people in there. Here's the statistic that people often do not get to see. Oh, I'm behind. Uh, in our support services, we have uh, our uh, director of child nutrition was state director of child nutrition, uh, was statewide recognized as statewide director for child nutrition for being the very best. They serve about 136,000 or 137,000 meals annually. On any good given day, they're serving six or 7,000 meals to kids. This year and last year, no child had any reason for not eating because every child was afforded a free reduced, a free meal by the federal government. Next year, those rules will change a little bit, but they work really, really hard. Maintenance, our maintenance crew, 5,700 work orders a, every year. We have a, a director of maintenance, Mark Stahl, that's here. Most of those work orders are taking place uh, within a day or two. I think about 95% of them are handled within seven days, and that includes if we have to buy something because a TikTok challenge said you need to steal a urinal off of the bathroom wall. Can y'all believe that? People took a urinal and tried to put it in a backpack. First of all, ladies, if y'all never been in a men's restroom, don't touch the urinal. <laughs> because men don't realize they are not good aims. Uh, but we want to steal a urinal. Uh, we see with our technology, 7,590 work orders. That seemed like a lot of work orders, but folks, we have more than 10,000 devices in this district. Sixth through 12th grade, every student is given a device, and below sixth grade, every student in our district has access to a device individually. And so there's a lot of devices out there that kids are taking and bringing and doing all that. Our technology department does a great job with that. And then transportation, we have new transportation directors. Eric here with us today. 
Eric, good to see you. Eric came to us this year whenever our friend uh, retired. And so Eric's doing a great job out there with us. They travel about 2,700 miles a day and transport more than uh, 2,500 students. All of our staff, we are proud that we have certified staff and that they're very good. We have a mentor program. We have a health and wellness program. We've had seen an uptick in the number of people who are staff members for us who need to utilize employee assistance program. They need a counseling session. They need somebody to talk to. They're having financial trouble. They've lost a loved one. They're, they're struggling with just a lot of things in this pandemic culture. And so we try to create this nest around our people to support them whenever they have challenges that are beyond their ability to handle. And if you watch the news, folks, everything's out of control. Everything's out of control. You need to, we, we have folks that we have to remind, there is a sane world around you. Uh, and so, uh, we have a grow your own program. If you're a paraprofessional, if you are a maintenance worker, if you are a transportation person, if you're someone trying to be a teacher, we have funds and resources available to help you achieve that goal. All we say is if you earn that certificate on our dollar, then you ought to stay here and work for us for a little while and, and let us recoup some of that money. And then the other thing we're very proud of, and the board took action on this uh, uh, last summer whenever insurance rates went up, the board always tries to stay ahead of, of the insurance rate for an individual policy. So every employee can have health insurance at no cost to them. That's an important thing, is that our employees can have that health insurance. So let me jump to this whole child. This is one of our new uh, pillars. And so we have a develop a system that targets a social emotional development for all students and staff. How many of you were educators, my, my retired folks will know this, who took a human development course? You know that a child will crawl before it walks. In most cases, we had four boys and if they could pull up, they'd go. But oftentimes now we see people that don't understand developmental milestones. They don't understand why this child's acting this way. And sometimes we put rules in place that are more strict for the students than we have for the adults. And so we're working through this process of trying to educate folks about developmentally, what does it mean to be a sixth grader? What kind of capabilities do you have? Do you understand these kind of consequences? And so this is all part of the whole child piece. And so we'll go back and talk briefly. I'll touch on it. This issue over behavioral support and health. Rhonda Burnell, again, has been working really hard with UMHB in Texas A&M Central Texas uh, and Texas State University. And we have interns that come. They work under her. And they have been valuable, valuable resources to go out and meet kids in small groups or individually. Folks in this pandemic situation, we have very young kids who are talking about doing detrimental things to themselves because they feel like there's no hope, that the world is just too much for them. That's a hard thing to talk about with an eight-year-old kid. So we're very pleased about that. And then we also have great relationships with Central County Services and started counseling through our community partnerships. And you'll see in there we see T-Chat listed as well. It's a very, very good program. We also have partnerships with the Methodist Children's Home. And then we also do a newsletter and provide support services to staff. You know what? The adults can't do their job very well if they are in the middle of a meltdown or a, or a circumstance or situation that's beyond their control. So uh, we've been very good about trying to do that. Rick, we're going to hit your facilities, as we say in East Texas, with a lick and a promise. Um, so facilities, we always want to make sure that we have the best facilities available for kids. I want to brag on our custodial staff. Our custodial staff, every custodian has to clean more than 19,000 square feet a day. So for those of you who have homes that are about 2,000 square feet, just take that times 10 and think, ooh, I would want to clean that. But our custodians do a great job. Our maintenance does a great job. We still have facilities that are more than 100 years old that we're using. We are right now renovating facilities that are 50 or 60 years old because they've got good bones, they've been well maintained, and we're just having to make sure that they have a restroom. Hetty Halstead, Billy Diaz is the principal over there. They have one faculty restroom. It's in her office. So if you go in her office and you hear the flush, you know there's somebody coming out of the closet. Uh, but, I mean, there's just, it just wasn't made for people like it is now. And we have support people. We have counselors. We have behavioral coaches. We have all kinds of things. So campuses are undergoing some of those renovations. And uh, just to remind you, we have 11 campuses, three support facilities. 
We have a facility that's more than 120 years old, and our newest facilities are transportation department. And then our maintenance custodial staff, that number is growing. By the time we finish with all of our projects, we'll be over 2 million square feet of facilities that have to be maintained. Facility improvements, let me run through them real quick. Um, we're doing work, and people say, why don't you build a new facility? Well, an elementary school now is about $35 million. A brand new high school without a stadium and without an auditorium is $130 million. So we're taking good care of the facilities we got, and we're trying to exploit those so we can meet kids' needs better. Copper School High School, we have... Um, we have a drainage project over there that's going on because we want to create more usable space. And then we have a new CT building that'll be going up. And that CT building will be welding and building trades that'll be located behind the high school to the north of the new gym. And it will give us room there. At May Stevens, that renovation is almost, well, no, let me just say, that renovation is ongoing, huh, Rick? Um, uh, they built a brand new cafeteria. They're taking the old cafeteria and repurposing that for classroom space. And we've been diligent about these renovations, trying to create secure vestibules. So if somebody comes in and they're intent on doing harm, that they can't really get to people or kids. They, they can get in this enclosed area, but they can't go beyond that. Well, what if somebody tries to break out of glass? Just without telling you everything, we have some security measures in place, and it would, it'll be a tough for them to do that. But we want to make sure our staff and students are protected at all costs. At Williams-Ledger, we're adding classrooms on both the Williams and the Ledger side. Martin Walker Elementary, is, they've already renovated the front offices. There's a cafeteria and classrooms being added on the back. And then at Halstead, they are going to give you more than one bathroom, Billy. Congratulations. And it's not going to be a porta potty um, So... <laughs> Uh, they'll get uh, they'll get a renovated front office area. We'll renovate a, a music classroom down there, and that becomes some space for some students with special needs. And so uh, they'll get uh, Martin Walker. If you've not been there in a while, they got rid of their orange floor tile. I know you Longhorns hate that, but uh, we're going back with maroon. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, but we're trying to we're trying to. We're trying to fix up these campuses where we can continue to maintain them. So lots and lots of work. Rick takes care of those things. And so we appreciate him and Mark Stahl, our director of maintenance. Thank you and your folks for always being at the ready to help. Um, the last pillar in our strategic plan is stakeholder engagement. How in the world do we enrich these relationships and give back? This is my issue and the issue I've had since I've been here. We, for a long time, have been takers of resources. And so I've spoken to CTE. We have one of our co-directors here today, Ms. Sandra Perry. The other's Brenda Stanford, and Brenda's at the campus because they're doing masonry rocks today because the masonry industry is very short on masons, and they are trying to recruit kids straight out of school, uh, making $24 an hour. Uh, so it's pretty nice. But how do we get back to the community? Well, we still do a lot of taking. Our adoptee units, if you're a member of adoptee unit, thank you, thank you, thank you for the hard work that you do and everything that you do. Our property owners and parents and guardians, I will tell you this, we have kids sometimes because of the pandemic, they were not in school for two years, they were virtual, they did all these other things, and they come in and our people look at us and say, whew, man, that little guy doesn't know what it's like to be indoors with other people, does he? And I said, well, you just have to housebreak them again. Well, we've been housebreaking the first semester and teaching people how to live together and interact with each other and get along with each other. And that just because somebody changes the channel doesn't mean you can get up and knock them in the head. You know, just, just stuff. And you can't wallow around on the floor like a caterpillar that's had gasoline poured on him because you didn't get your way. Um, and that's just at the high school. Uh, and so... Uh, We've been trying to help kids work through that process, so our campuses have done a very good job of setting up a structured environment for kids to learn to interact in there. But I'll tell you what, parents always send us their very best. Nobody has ever sent a kid to school and said, well, you know, this ain't so good, but I'm going to send him and let y'all work on him a little while. They send us our very best, and I remind our staff of that every day. Every kid doesn't learn the same way, and they don't always learn the same day, but every kid has the ability to learn. And so we have to find the way to connect with them to accomplish the task that's before us. We do thank our property owners because they contribute about $15.5 million a year in local tax revenue. 
to keep Copper's Cove going. Now that's about 20% of our budget. The rest of it comes from state and federal funds, but those dollars are critically important for our success. Our Copper's Cove Education Foundation, we have members here today. Those folks don't get any pay. They don't get anything other than personal satisfaction. They've given away about 350 or $400,000 in innovative teaching grants over the years just because they want to support teachers. They do things like new teacher breakfast. They have a gala coming up April the 9th, and I happen to have tickets today if you need some. Uh, but, and the reason I'm saying that, because if I don't sell them, I have to buy them. Um, that's just one of the secrets. Uh, but this year, after two years of not having a gala, they're going to have a gala again on April the 9th. It's going to be right here. It's going to be a lot of fun. We encourage you to come kick your heels up and have a good time and support the Education Foundation who supports teachers and kids. We have those military-friendly campuses. Our adopted units this year are not all the way back to where they were prior to COVID because there's still some restrictions on them because they're on a federal base and it's federal government and we can't decide whether you wear a mask, two masks, a cloth mask, a NK 95, 57, 31, 22. Uh, but I will tell you, those folks have donated over 100,000 100, hours to our kids through summer programming and through, through the work that they do on campus. And you heard a story about Martin Walker. Listen, Martin Walker's not alone. These folks work diligently with every campus. We have one on every campus, so thank them. And um, I, I have to, the principal send me these, so I gotta read at least one good thing from every campus. I'm gonna start with the babies, May Stevens Elementary. If you ever need a fix, if you ever need a, a, a note of encouragement, go to May Stevens Early Learning Academy. Them four-year-olds are a kick, I'm telling you, they are a hoot. I went in one day and a little boy said, are you the president? <laughs> I said, no. He's much older than me. <laughs> he said, but isn't your name Barack? I said, baby, you ain't even got the right color down. What are you talking about? But he had me down as President Barack. And I'm thinking, that kid ain't even old enough to know who Barack Obama is. But he had me picked. And I was just thankful that I wasn't the first lady. Uh, <laughs> So they're getting a lot of work done over there. They're getting four big classrooms added to that campus, new playground equipment. We always try to make sure those playgrounds are safe for kids and that they're accessible by all kids, regardless of ability or mobility. So they're getting some things done there. They've done a really neat program this year where they're doing home reading. They're sending little books home with kids, and parents get to read with them. You know what? The best thing you can do as a parent is read with your kid. Let them read to you. And then ask them about things. And for some of you older folks, Jim, it's not C-Spot Run anymore. Uh, it's, you know, it, it is good reading. It's good reading. And that campus won out of all the campuses. They're a little campus, about 400 kids. We have a high school with 2,200. But those, that campus won the anti-bullying campaign for Paint the School Orange for raising awareness for bullying. And they did it right. So congratulations to y'all, Leah, for the work that you've done. Clemens Parsons Elementary, Jen Maples is here. Jen Maples, a new principal up there doing a great job. They were recognized by First Lady Jill Biden because they were named the Student to Student Military Child Education Coalition Initiative Elementary School Team of the Year. Out of all the schools around the nation who participate, <laughs> Clemens Parsons got it. They also hustled real hard in the Food for Families uh, food drive, and they won first place, so we're very glad and proud for them. We have Fairview Jewel here, Fairview Jewel Elementary. We have Rebecca Shuck as principal. I hate to tell you all this, but I am going to brag, and you know, so they say it ain't bragging if it's the truth. We have the Elementary School Counselor of the Year off of Fairview Jewel Elementary. Please stand up. I know she's back there. There she is. There she is. Region 12, Elementary School Counselor of the Year and deserves it. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful young lady cares about our kids. They're doing some really neat things with restorative practices to decrease the number of student discipline referrals. And they are also working on Student of the Month. I was uh, going home the other day and there's this yard sign out. And I thought it was a political yard sign. I thought, oh, Lord, they're up in our neighborhood. They'll have something in my yard. And I looked over. 
in its Fairview Jewel. The little neighbor boy, or neighbor girl, pardon me, was girl. Yes. Is her mama back there? Oh, Lord of mercy. I try to close the blinds and lock the door when she comes around that cold. No, I'm not. But name student of the month. And that's a great yard sign. I mean, I'm surprised somebody hadn't stolen it out of your yard. But you do have a dog, so that could keep it. But great things going on at Fairview Jewel. Hetty Halstead. Hetty Halstead, little in, in uh, size, but mighty. And they are doing a fantastic job. They had a trunk or treat night, and it was it was uh, coordinated with their adopt a school unit, attended like crazy by people in that neighborhood. About ninety percent of her kids, or ninety five percent of Billy Diaz's kids on that campus, walk to school. So very few buses run over there. When you do something at that school, the community comes. Billy's hosted things like the um, the uh, I started to say Meals on Wheels. You don't have any kids old enough for Meals on Wheels. Uh, <laughs> But the food bank, she's hosted food bank truck came over to families that had needs and they distributed. They've done great things. They've done a Read Across America Day and they partnered with the Copperscope High School cheer and baseball team. And then their student council won. They have a nice big trophy. The, one of the littlest campuses in Copper's Cove beat Colleen, Temple, Belton, and all the other Copper's Cove schools, and they won the Recycle Bowl for Fort Hood and got recognized last month with the, with the uh, Garrison Commander came and their, their uh, recycle recruiter, uh, recycle coordinator, and they had a great time. So thank you, Billy, for all the work that you do over there. Todd Williams, House Creek, they have what they call hallway heroes, kids and things that do great things in the hallway. Your behavior counts. They're really working on a kindness challenge out there to make sure that they are helping kids not just develop grit, but also empathy for others. You know, in this world where things have been chaotic, we're not very empathetic to one another. We're hollering and being ugly and doing all those things. We need to reinstitute this idea of the golden rule, treat others like you want to be treated. Todd and them are doing a great job with that. They have an anti-bullying program called Start With Hello and Unity Day. And then they have something, and I would go to it, but I couldn't get up and leave. Yoga. They do yoga in the mornings uh, two days a week, three days a week, and they just go to the gym. Kids that want to go down there and do yoga, they go down there and stretch out and do all that other stuff. I could go down there and lay out, but not stretch out. <laughs> Uh, and so they're doing a wonderful job with kids. Mary, Derek, hey, Mary, stand up. I want you to know we have two retreads. We have folks that, uh, you know, they wore all the rubber off that tire, and they went back, and they got retreaded, and we're back. Mary retired as principal at May Stevens Early Learning Academy, previous fame at Hetty Halstead. She's been with this district forever. If you know Mary, you know Mary. She's a sweetheart. Uh, we uh, had a principal promote, Dr. Earl Parcell, promoted to district CFO. I reached out to Mary. I said, Mary, I, I, I need a favor. She said, oh, Okay. <laughs> what do you want? And I told her, she said, oh, I got to pray about that. <laughs> and so about two days later, she called me. She said, I'm in. I'll do it. So she is interim principal at Martin Walker Elementary, doing a really good job. You saw their choir up here today, the Troublemakers. Isn't that a wonderful name? Troublemakers. Not trouble, but treble. And I'm telling you what, those kids are phenomenal. April Dawn Weimer is just a phenomenal music teacher. They love their adopt-a-school unit there. You heard them talk about that. The student-to-student -student program that they've got going out there is phenomenal. And I'll tell you what, that campus usually is one of the highest-performing campuses in the district. We're on track again to do a wonderful job out there this year. Mary's continued that high expectation. So, Mary, thank you for that. I have a good friend here named Doreen Vassar. Where's Doreen? Doreen said she wanted to come up here and dance for you all. And I told her, not today. <laughs> not today. But Doreen's also uh, works at Williams Ledger Elementary, and we have another retread out there. If we get Tracy Phillips to stand up, Tracy is a 33 year educator. <laughs> Tracy's been everything from an elementary, junior high, high school principal. She's been a superintendent of schools, she's been an assistant superintendent, and she retired and came to Coppers Cove. And Joan Manning outed her. Uh, we said we needed an interim. And John said, well, I know this lady that, you know, I don't know really what she did, but I think she's been an educator and all that. So I go in and I start pulling her applications. Tracy had applied for a job as a community outreach coordinator. So I called her in one day and I said, hey, 
you know, you got all this experience. Would be interested in doing something? Well, I don't know. So we talked about it. Uh, I put on a good schmooze show and all that, and she accepted, and she's out there leading uh, Williams Ledger Elementary, doing a great job. Williams Ledger Elementary, Doreen Vassar is one of my sweetest friends. I love Doreen. She sent me some notes. They're one big family out there, very flexible, willing to work and do anything for kids. That campus for the last 20 years has won the uh, award for most money raised and per capita money raised for um, United Way. And they have a number of staff out there that have been doing this for 35 years or more. So kudos to Williams Ledger Elementary. Thank you. I apologize. Real quick, Coppers Cove Junior High School banned 40 students, went to region. All 40 of them made region banned. That's phenomenal. Their little Coppers Cove Junior High School dance team called the Starlets won first place in competition. They had a duet that received third place. They had soloists that received first place and overall second team first place division champions and scored the highest of all dance teams. Their cheerleaders were named division champions at competition. And then they have a wonderful program out there called Farm to Table in January when they did board appreciation. The little, uh, their staffer, Miss Finney, who actually does the Farm to Table, she provided a breakfast for the board. Seven courses. Let me tell you something. When somebody my size gets tired of eating, it's a lot of courses. Every course was from a different country around the world, and they were all delicious. Jeff Shannon, thank you for the wonderful job you're doing at Copper School Junior High School. Brian Jost with SE Lee is here. Brian Jost, they have an active adopt a school unit he's very proud of. They have students who have achieved state and national champion recognitions in cheer and dance. The two junior highs go to different competitions, so we don't want them to be competing against each other. They raised more than uh, $8,550 for the uh, United Way, and their, their student council raised almost 2,000 or had almost 2,000 pounds of food generated for the uh, Food for Families program. And so we're very excited about the work that Brian and them are doing out there. <laughs> Pat Crawley. Where's Pat Crawley? There he is. Pat's here, and I want you to know Pat has taken Crossroads High School and has really turned it on its heels. When I first came, we would graduate about 30 or 40 kids a year. I think last year they graduated 111 kids in three graduation ceremonies. They have kids now that go to CTC, and they're actively engaged in the academic program and in the vocational program. They have a co-op program for working students. 58% of their students graduate early. Why is that important? Because some of those kids are kids who come back to school after being a dropout and they're trying to finish school. So Pat, you have Sharon Whitus with you today? Good. Uh, <laughs> Sharon is the one running the school, really. I just didn't want to. Uh, no, but Pat and Emma have done a wonderful job. They have a tiered system for kids. The kids work really hard, earning more credits than they ever did. We went during Board Appreciation Month, and I got to tell a story. Had a young lady who stood up and spoke, and she said, I'm at, Co I'm at Crossroads High School because I made a mistake. She said, I had a baby. I, I believe in the sanctity of life, and I believe that babies ain't ever a mistake. If we're truly all created in the image of God, they're not a mistake. She is going to school. She's going to CTC. And she wants to be a teacher. What a phenomenal story that young lady has. And I sat down with her and shared all the steps that we could take to help her become a teacher. Let me tell you what. It's not a dream put off. It's just a dream delayed sometimes. And so we want to look at the promise in every kid. That young lady is going to make it. Gobbers Cove High School, Dr. Jimmy Shuck. Where are you, sir? There he is. There he is. Please just bear with me because they have all of these kids and everything else. We have kids going to state in art. We have kids going to state in powerlifting. We have kids that went to state in wrestling. We have the girls' volleyball team who, team who out of 16 in the last 17 years have made the playoffs. Carrie, how many years did your girls make academic all district? The whole varsity squad. The whole varsity squad, 14 years. In a row, every girl on that varsity squad had a 90 average or above. Am I correct, Carrie? A 90 average or above for their whole school career for 14 straight years. What a phenomenal legacy. Thank you. 
Carrie Lauer leads that program as the 10th winningest coach in the state of history in Texas, 869 wins, I believe, and uh, she's only 25. And so our band always performs at the top of the heap. I call it the band of bands, the one that is often emulated but never duplicated. They are the best of the best. And so our band went, competed. They advanced all the way into region, highest ranking they've ever had when they get to uh, area, I think. And those kids did a phenomenal job. We have kids, uh, we have 36 students that went to UIL, UIL Solo and Ensemble. 26 of them received a superior rating, which is a one, no higher rating. And then two of the ensembles of those kids received a superior rating and gold medals. We had nine students who have made the TMEA Region 8 Wind, on, uh, wind Symphony. We have a student who's in the, in the orchestra. We have 10 in the concert band and nine in symphonic band for the region. We have 14 students who are freshmen in that band who went, and we had eight of those 14 selected to play in the region band. UIL band and solo and ensemble on the 26th of February, they had 76 students participate. 22 of those 76 received the highest rating gold medals in solo and ensemble. Eight of them received other medals, and they had 39 students advancing to state out of those 76 students. What a phenomenal band program continues to be. Cheerleaders, they've won uh, All-American and Universal Cheerleaders Association Cheer Camp. Copperettes, they went and competed. We have uh, Amari Sneed, who got first place. They had a trophy first place for Team Novelty and Team Jazz and Team Contemporary. They won the Showmanship Award. In swim, we had kids qualify for the regional swim meet. We had wrestlers for the first time this year in how many years, Becky Jewell? Seven or eight? that went to state competition for wrestling. We had kids in football that made all district. We had volleyball that made all district. Uh, our most valuable player in District 12 6A was Emma Waziak, uh, the last Waziak kid to play volleyball. That's why Carrie quit. It's because there's no more Waziaks. Uh, and then we have a young lady, Kyra Gaston, was selected to be this Texas Sports Writers Association All-State team as a middle blocker. Cross country, we had all district kids. Basketball, we had academic all district and first and second team selections. Girls basketball, we had first and second team selections. Wrestling, we have two, three kids actually that went uh, second team at All-State for wrestling. We have kids who qualified. We have uh, about 12 kids that qualified boys and girls. So if you have a young man and he's thinking about roughing up one of these girls, think twice. He may get laid out. Uh, and then we have 14 girls that went March 5th to the regional powerlifting meet. And Coach Thompson, how many made state? Four kids made state and regional. You got a kid that weighs 105 pounds and she's lifting 240. That's a phenomenal, phenomenal group of kids. This year, for the first time, we had Skills USA competition. Brenda Drawdy, one of our co-directors, helped get that started. I cannot tell you how many first place finishes. It's two pages just of kids who won first place with Skills USA. We have kids in HOSA who are going, uh, and they won awards for the blood drive and then competition. We have DECA, who is, we just approved last night, uh, six kids that are going to international competition in Atlanta, Georgia. We have, for the first time ever, Dr. Shuck sent me this, very proud of it. We have four students who went through and earned their EKG certification. Uh, four of them took it, four of them passed at the national passing rate 69%. We had 100% with our kids, and those young folks can go into allied health sciences and make a good living as an EKG technician. Wonderful, wonderful job. <laughs> we have kids in the Texas Association of Future Educators that advanced to state. As I said, DECA had 16 of their 19 students advanced to state, and then they have some that have advanced to nationals. Folks, we could go on and on about the great things that are going on in Copper's Cove. I had somebody the other day say, well, you know, I don't see much about Copper's Cove in the paper. Well, there's not a lot of dirt out there. You know, the newspapers sometimes, not ours locally, let me pick on one that is in another town in Copper's Cove East. Um, and they like to talk about, about the districts and all their failings. Listen, all of us, have failed at something. And some of us have done it very publicly. But you know what? It's not the number of failures that counts. It's how many times you get up, brush yourself off, and get back in the game. And so our folks work really hard to make a difference, a meaningful difference for kids. Our board works really, really hard 
to make a meaningful difference for kids. That's our goal. We want every kid to become the optimum young adult that they can be. And that's where we're investing our time, our energy, and our effort. And we thank you for partnering with us. I, I have, I mean, I look across here and I look at our lodges, I look at our altruces and morning and noon exchange and Optimus and Lions and Rotary and I look at the city and I, I look at Chamber and everybody else. Folks, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to work with each one of you to make a difference for the kids that we serve. Our success is our success story. We don't do it alone. Helen Keller made a comment one time after going through all that she did to become educated and be able to communicate and do all those things. And her quote is, alone we can do so little. Together we can do so much. It takes us all. That's an African proverb. That's not Hillary Clinton. She stole that. It does take a village to raise a child and to do it well. So thank you for being our village. Thank you for all of the energy, effort, expertise, and resources you provide us. Thank you for pouring into our community so we can pour it into our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.